Hello everyone, today I'm going to be doing a modding tutorial on 1.13.2. So I'm going to be starting from scratch and uh, just basically from the point you would download the MDK to starting with nothing. Now there is something I forgot to pull up. So today we're actually going to be just uh, downloading the MDK and working with that directly, but I do have this uh, little project which generates kind of a like a very bare bones mod to work as a starting point and uh, this does require Python to run but if you want to you can download this and just uh, kind of play around with it to get it to edit uh, create something. I've not actually looked at this project in a while so it may not <laughs> work with the latest version of Forge. I think it does. It hasn't been that long since I worked on it but uh, you can find this on my github it's mod template generator. Anyway, what you would normally do is go to files.minecraftforge.net. On the left, you would select your Minecraft version, and I do recommend disabling your ad blocker to support Forge. I'm just doing this for the sake of the video. And uh, then you would go to, right now we've only got latest. You would choose from either latest or recommended. I'd typically go with latest, and then download the MDK. So I've already downloaded that here. And I'm going to go ahead and extract this into a folder I created just for this project. So we can go ahead and uh, close the zip file now. And there is one more thing I'd like to mention before. Sometimes Forge Gradle breaks on me. I've not quite figured it out yet, but if you ever get to a point where it says something like it cannot find the Minecraft resources directory or I forget what exactly the message is, but it just won't even build your mod when you try to run it. Uh, what you can do is you can go to your Gradle caches, so that'll be your user folder. Then there should be a .gradle folder, which may be hidden, hidden depending on your operating system. Then go to caches and delete the entire Forge Gradle folder. You'll have to re-download all the files that are in here. But, uh, I mean, the, the whole process is automatic. It takes maybe 15 minutes for me. Uh, every time I update one of my mods in particular and do a publish to Maven Local, it just totally screws up the Forge Gradle cache. I have no idea why. But if you ever run into any issues and you can't figure it out, just try deleting the Forge Gradle folder in caches. So, now to IntelliJ. I'm going to go to Import Project. And since I've already tried and failed to record this video once, it's already got the right file selected. You want the build.gradle. It's been a while since I've recorded. All my software is... <laughs> I haven't quite gotten the settings down yet. Should be fine this time. Okay, and we want to make sure use default gradle wrapper is checked. Okay. And gradle will begin doing its thing. Since I've already got this version of Forge downloaded and cached, it shouldn't take too long. This may take you upwards of like 10 to 15 minutes. Anyway, while it's setting that up, uh, we can go ahead and start looking at our files. There's actually a couple things we'll need to edit. And... I could have sworn I wiped out my code from here. Okay, um, oh, there it goes. I guess it was IntelliJ's cache. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the mods.toml file. This is in resources, meta inf. And we need to go ahead and choose a mod ID here, which I'll just call it tutorial. That needs to be lowercase letters, and I believe you can use underscores as well. But typically, mod IDs are just all lowercase letters. Got a uh, display name here where we could type something more user-friendly. Update JSON URL, I'm going to go ahead and just comment that out. Display URL, I typically use this to link to the CurseForge page where I upload the mod. Logo file, if you want, you can put a a ping file, or I don't know if other image types are supported, just put it directly in the resources folder. 
and change this to match the name. And we get a credits field, authors field, where you could possibly put your name in there, a long description field, which is multi-line. And then we may need to change these to match our mod ID here. I'm not actually 100% sure about that, but I would go ahead and change them. And our dependencies should be fine as they are. Okay, and it looks like Gradle is finished. I'm going to go ahead and come to the Gradle tab over here and click Refresh one more time just to make sure it's got everything. You can go under Source Sets Main, make sure you've got Forge in here. Should have a bunch of other stuff underneath it as well. And we can go ahead and get rid of that. And I need to increase my font size, don't I? Okay, 15, let's do 24. There we go. Should be nice and big and easy to read. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the main mod class here. So one thing we need to do is we need to change this to match our mod ID. Let's go ahead and rename the class as well to kind of match up with that. Just tutorial mod, you can use Shift F6 to rename something. So the structure is a, a bit different now. We've still got events, but those events are different from previous versions. So one thing you'll notice is this FML lod, mod loading context and I'll get on that and get mod event bus and then we can add listeners to different events from there. We still got the old Minecraft Forge event bus, which is used for most types of events, but these lifecycle events need to go on that lifecycle event bus. So we'll see that uh, we've got um, a couple of methods here already. We're handling FML common setup event. This is fired after the registry event. So when this event is fired, we know that all mods have registered all their blocks and items and so on. And if you want to know what the other lifecycle event bus or lifecycle events are, we can go to mod lifecycle event. And in IntelliJ, you can click this little icon here and it'll show you all classes that override this one. So we can see we got a client setup event, which is called about the same time as common, but only on the client. Dedicated server event is called only on dedicated servers, not integrated, which would be single player. I don't actually know what the fingerprint thing is. Load complete. Uh, I think that's... Yeah, that's not one that mods are meant to use. And then intermod in queue and intermod process are two other events of note. And you can see we're getting the IMC events here and it's sending kind of a dummy message. Actually, let me reformat that code. There we go. That's easier to read. And here we're also catching the FML server starting event. This is useful for registering commands. And there's some other things that you may want to register in this event. It's another pretty important one. And that is... Where is that caught exactly? Okay, yeah, that, that'll be the Minecraft Forge event bus. Where is that? I feel like that's wrong. I've not actually looked at the example mod in the in a while. It does things slightly differently from how I do them. So uh, let me actually... Kind of take a look. We're about to start. Okay, I don't actually... Uh, I'm actually using server about to start instead of server starting. But it looks like that goes on the Minecraft Forge event bus, which is usually what the subscribe event annotation means. And it also has an example of catching the block registry event here. Okay, so I actually need to fix the package name here. So that's how I would typically do my package names. Typically it's something like com, net, or whatever. 
dot and then your name dot and then something unique for the mod. Okay, and still has a com.example package. There we go. So you could go ahead and start registering blocks and items and stuff in this class. Personally, I like to do things a slightly different way. So let's go ahead and create package called init. And I'm trying to think if I want to go ahead and set up the proxy. That might be a good idea. Let me just move that over there so I can see it. So yeah, let's go ahead and create our proxy class. I've been calling them side proxy, and in here we're going to have two nested classes that inherit from it. And those can be package private. So going to have a client extend side proxy. And then a server extends side proxy. Okay, and both of these are going to need a constructor. Come back to that in just a moment. I'm going to add one method to client for now called client setup, and we're going to catch the FML client setup event and do nothing with that right now. But we do need to add that to the lifecycle event bus. And could just go ahead and make that static. Why do you not like that? Oh, type register instead of add listener. Okay. I think that's all you really need here. And give the server version the same treatment. Server setup and FML dedicated server setup event. Okay, so we're not going to use those events for anything right now. Maybe in the future we will. So we're going to go back up to the parent class, side proxy, and do some work on that. This one will need a constructor as well. Come back to in a minute. Could do a common setup event. else might we need? Could do the IMC events as well. And just copy those and remove everything. Don't want to do anything with those. Okay, and let's go ahead and add the server starting as well. It was server starting, right? Yes. And that actually needs to be Minecraft Forge .event bus .add listener. Okay. Get rid of these accidental imports. 
So this is a basic outline for a proxy class. Now we actually need to use this. So back to the main mod class, uh, I'm going to go ahead and clear out some of these methods that we're not using anymore. And I'll clear out the registry events in a moment as well. All right. I'm going to go ahead and add a couple of constants up here. Uh, a lot of people like to put these in their own class. I like to do them in the main mod class. So I'm going to go ahead and store the mod ID here as well. And for consistency, let's go ahead and change that in the annotation as well. I think that's the main thing we need here. All right, so let's go ahead and... Uh, do something with that proxy. So this is something that's very new. So we need this class, dist executor, and we're going to call run for dist. And this is kind of odd, but <laughs> just go with it. So we need a supplier of a supplier of something. And the reason we have the wrapped supplier is it will prevent class loading on the sides that are not needed. So by doing this, you won't be loading client-side classes on the server, for instance. But to make sure this works, you have to use the arrow operator twice. You can't use method references here. So what we want to do is that, that, and then new side proxy dot client. And then the second one is for the server. So side proxy dot server like that and with the way I have IntelliJ configured it's actually complaining about this saying it can be replaced by a method reference which it cannot so I'm gonna go ahead and suppress that okay and there are a couple of other methods that I like to put into my mods and let me see I guess all these could be useful so I'm going to go ahead and paste these in here. And, okay, yeah, that's a small issue. Okay, yeah, let me actually tweak this just a little bit. I'll be right back. Okay, so this should work. So first, I've got a version for, a <laughs> method for getting a version of our mod. So to do this, we're calling modList.get, .get mod container by ID, and passing in our mod ID. And we're going ahead and checking to make sure it is present, which it would be very strange if our mod was not loaded, but it was executing code, but whatever. So then we're saying get mod info .get version to string. And you may have seen I had some additional checks in there earlier, which I've just gone ahead and removed. And if for whatever reason that fails, we just return none which is what it's going to return when we're working on this in our development environment anyway. Second, I've got this isDevBuild method, which is basically just checking to see if the version is equal to none. And if it is, we, we can be reasonably sure that we're in a development environment. So if you want to call this method and say, like, register some stuff that you don't want to be in a release build, you could do that. Finally, I've got this get ID method, which is just kind of a shortcut. It's a pain to constantly type return new resource location, my mod dot mod ID path, whatever. So this is just kind of a shortcut. So with this, we can do something like tutorial mod dot get ID and then whatever here. It's just a little shortcut. It's not necessary, but I like doing this because you have to type new resource location a lot. It gets old. So add those three methods to your mod if you want to, or don't if you don't. All right, so finally, let's go ahead and just run our mod, I suppose. Uh, I'll go ahead and put some random logging statement in here as well. Probably should have run this a while back, but that's fine. The logger is not public. I would like that to be public. Logger. I'll just do an info. Now debug should show up. If everything is configured correctly.
Okay. So now to run Minecraft, we're going to open up the Gradle tab again. Go to Tasks, FG Runs, Run Client. And then after you've clicked that the first time, you can access it from the Run Configurations up here on the top right. You can just select it. Then you can press this to just run it, or you can press this to debug if you want to use the debugger. Okay, and let's go ahead and make sure our logging statement, uh, yes, there it is, right there. And just to confirm, we can see our mod is in the mods list, uh, version none. And it, you can see it's pulling stuff from the mods.toml file that we edited earlier. So whatever information you may want to display to the user, you can add to your description or the different fields. So could go ahead and create a world, but it wouldn't really do much since we're not really doing anything with the mod. So I guess one last thing we could do is set up a git repo. So if you already have git installed, one way you can do this is in Windows, you can shift right click in Explorer. Do you need to shift right click? No, you don't. I was thinking of PowerShell and then git bash here. There are other utilities you can use for git. Uh, I often use git crocken for working with my projects, which is very easy to use. Uh, you can easily see changes and pick which ones you want to stage for your next commit. For the sake of uh, creating a repo, let's actually um, just do, use git bash. Actually, I'm not going to be signed in if I use this web browser. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and create a new git repository for this. Something like that. Public. I'm not going to initialize this with any files for right now. Could do that, but I'll, I'll pull them from somewhere else later. Let's go ahead and create repository, and it will give us some hints as to what we need to do. So we need to type git init to actually initialize our repository. So we now have a git repository, which we can use to add files. We can actually type git status to see that we've got some files here that we need to add. And I would actually like to... Let's go ahead and get rid of some of these files that we don't need for right now. That's the forge changelog, I think. All right. Okay, so then let's do git add. Git add dot adds all of them. Okay, then we do a commit. Just call it first commit. All right. Now we need to link this up to GitHub. So git remote add origin. Just copy that. And in this case, we have to use shift insert to paste. Okay. Then finally git push u origin master. And this initial setup is more complex. Normally you would just use git add to add the files, git commit to do the commit, and then git push with no extra parameters to push it to the repo. So now if we refresh the page, we should see that we've got our files here. So yeah, we should add a readme file and a license later on, but for right now this is fine. I just wanted to show creating a GitHub repo it's a very useful way to keep track of your code. If you break something, you can revert to a previous commit. If your hard drive crashes, you've got the files on GitHub, so you won't lose your work. It's just, you use some kind of source control like Git. You're doing yourself and everyone else a favor. Okay, so I'm going to cut this here. This is a bit long. I know we haven't really done anything with the mod yet, but... Uh, well, we've been recording over 30 minutes, so probably need to cut this short. So thank you for watching. If you have anything in particular you would like to see covered in the future, let me know. Hopefully I can go further with this tutorial than I have in the past.
And if you liked the video, hit the thumbs up. If you disliked it, hit the thumbs down. And I'll see you next time.